Good afternoon, everyone, and um, we thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. We, uh, we don't do theory and practice separate. We don't believe in silos. So we're actually going to do theory and practice together today. So we're going to do theory, and then we're going to have an example in Susutu uh, that Dr. Makatoni is going to, to um, explain to you. Okay. The translation of the oral aspects of the biblical text for oral audiences has been described as translation from oral orality to orality. In other words, the oral features of the source text are represented as oral features in the target text. In actual practice, however, the translational situation involved in oral Bible translation is much more complex. In the first place, the notions of oral and written are not mutually exclusive, nor are they opposite poles along a continuum. Rather, as we shall describe below, they are two modalities of language which are intertwined. The twin modalities of oral language and written language are also culturally instantiated in that the features of orality must be identified for each culture, just as the discourse or text linguistic features of written language differs between cultures. We cannot assume that the categories of oral and written are universal categories with universal or conventional features. Rather, they must be understood within a specific linguistic and cultural context. Secondly, the Bible as a written text exhibits a complex interface of oral and written features, which can best be described using complexity theory. Third, the production of an oral Bible translation requires the translator to identify oral and written features and decide how to represent them in translation. Translation choices may be described using persis semiotics as iconic. The target text bears a relationship of similarity to the source text. Indexical, the target text points to or bears a relationship of causality to the source text. And symbolic, the target text bears a conventional relationship to the source text. Attention to the semiotics of translation has practical implications for representing the source text of the Bible in meaningful ways in an oral translation. In this paper, we will build upon our previous research on the semiotics and orality of Bible translation to explore the practical implications of Persis semiotics for oral Bible translation within a complexity approach. The paper is organized as follows. Uh, in section two, we describe complexity theory in Bible translation. In section three, we present our views concerning the media history of the Bible. In section four, we describe the oral, oral, written, visual features and their interface in the incipient biblical text. In section five, we um, introduce Persis semiotics with respect to oral Bible translation. And in section six, we provide a practical example of the semiotics of oral Bible translation the oral translation of Lamentations chapter 1 into Susutu based upon an analysis of the oral features of a contemporary Susutu lament. Uh, complexity theory has recently emerged as a new paradigm to study complex systems such as translation and religion. Complexity does not mean complicated or difficult. Rather, complexity is marked by an involvement of many parts, aspects, details, and notions, which must be meticulously studied in order to be understood. Complexity theory examines systems that are too, uh, too multifaceted to be adequately conceptualized in terms of only one elementary concept or idea. Instead, what is required is an explanation that is actually a whole set of simultaneous interacting understandings. The open interplay of multiple interacting elements such as cognition, consciousness, experience, human interaction, society, culture, and history, etc., force the view that these systems are a complex phenomena in which the effects of these components are interconnected. Complex phenomena also are characterized, uh, characterized by emergence. Emergence refers to properties that can only be studied at a different level without reducing it to one of a system's basic constituents. For example, the bees in a beehive have psychological and biological properties at one level of analysis but their social behavior is a property that emerges from the collection of bees in a beehive and needs to be analyzed at a different level. Emergence explains the relationship between cultural phenomena 
as both emerging from and non-reducible to. The recent work by Kubis Mare uh, has explored translation as a complex emergent phenomenon. Translation is a complex phenomenon in that it cannot be reduced to a single feature strategy or approach. Translation is also emergent. Like literature, translation is based on language and it cannot be conceptualized without recourse to language, but at the same time, it cannot be reduced to language. Based on his view of translation as a complex emergent phenomenon, Marais proposes using the terms incipient texts and subsequent text instead of the traditional terms source text and target text. Marais' argument in using these terms is that translation is first and foremost a process in time. The terms incipient text and subsequent text perfectly explain the translations of sacred texts in the sense that it is impossible to know whether a text uh, is an ultimate source text or the final target text, but one can aptly characterize them as incipient and subsequent. The translation of sacred writings provides a particularly fertile field for the exploration of translation as an emergent phenomenon in light or the fact that the concept of an emergent complex adaptive system characterizes both sacred writings as incipient texts or source texts and sacred writings as subsequent texts or target texts. Bible translation as a complex system fits within religion generally and within the sociology of religion specifically. As a complex system, religion exhibits four aspects of complexity and i'm not going to go into each of these aspects but there is an individual psychological factor which forms the first dimension of religion as a complex uh, phenomenon and it goes about identity which is constructed throughout life by drawing on this uh, resource then the second factor is a sociological factor uh, uh, and uh, 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 religion uh, are influenced by the social and cultural context in which they are situated. Uh, 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 they shape societies and societies shape that religion in a part. And then the third dimension focuses on the chronological development of religion. The religions can be traced back in time and it developed and uh, so it is a changing uh, phenomenon over time. And the fourth dimension of religion as a complex phenomenon involves an oral written interface which is realized in religion, especially with respect to sacred writings. This dimension reflects aspects of the first three dim uh, dimensions in its features and is a potential agent for structural social change, mainly by means of social integration and unification of individuals. The words, texts, and language used in religious, uh, religious rigid, uh, rituals in the liturgy and in individual and public worship are the result of complex processes of canonization and translation. These writings are viewed as sacred, and even they are translations, they quickly assume the status of incipient source texts and are translated anew for believers from other language groups. For the ma majority of religious communities, contact with the sacred text is entirely through translation, which is necessary for their participation in the religious life of the community, while their adherence to that religious tradition is itself often the result of translation. The role and nature of oral and written language for religious communities is this of central importance and is not unique to the function of the Bible and its translation for Christian communities. A preliminary media history of translation has been described by Litau as consisting of four eras, the oral, manuscript, print, and digital. This conceptualization, however, is problematic in that it sees a dichotomy between an oral stage and a subsequent written manuscript stage. It is now acknowledged that the simple <clears throat> binary division of orality versus literacy cannot be accepted. 
In fact, de Vries has argued that absolute orality is, a, is rare among the cultures of the world. Instead, even seemingly oral cultures are involved in an oral written interface. Precisely how the oral written interface is manifested is locally determined and may even vary within a single culture with respect to time, place, or genre. Furthermore, the oral and written co-evolve through many points of contact. In terms of the biblical text, it can be argued that the oldest contents of both the Old and New Testaments were communicated orally. However, the orality of the Bible took place within the oral written interface of the literary cultures of the ancient Mediterranean. Walton and Sandy have conceptualized this interface by contrasting hearing-dominant cultures with text-dominant cultures. In hearing-dominant cultures, traditions were passed on by word of mouth. In text-dominant cultures, traditions were passed on by scribally produced texts. In the ancient Mediterranean, literacy was not absent in hearing-dominant societies. It was the scribes who were capable of reading and writing. There was no need for common people or even elites to become literate to function. In an ancient hearing dominant society, texts are largely documents written for a much more limited number of reasons than in a text dominant society. A culture's traditional texts were transmitted orally and internalized through memory, while copies of texts were written for archives and libraries and served as reference points for recitation and memorization. And although ancient Israelite society became increasingly dominant through the period of the monarchy, hearing dominance continued through the Greco-Roman period up until the invention of the movable type printing press. Using the con concept of hearing or text dominance, we have previously argued um, that the following is the media history of the Bible. We have a hearing dominant um, era where we have an oral, oral written communication of verbal interpretive culture, where we have an oral stage, the oral, oral, oral Bible, but we also have handwritten manuscript communication, so manuscript Bibles. Then in the text dominant uh, era begins with print communication with the printed Bible, a typographic interpretive culture, and we're now back in an electronic media communication era with the electronic Bible, a digital media um, interpretive culture. It's important to note that <clears throat> And what is depicted in the media history are dominant modalities of community communication in the process of development. In ancient Israel, in the earliest stages, scripture was probably conveyed and transmitted orally. But as it was written, it still functioned within a hearing dominant society. Most individuals experienced scripture orally rather than via written texts. It's only with the advent of printing that text dominated cultures came into existence. When the translated Bible was mass produced, it led to widespread literacy and the expansion of knowledge. Memorization of the biblical text became an exceptional achievement after the text existed primarily on the printed page rather than in the mind. In this electronic age, many aspects of ancient orality have reemerged. This new media environment has been described as electronically aided orality. Adam depicts it as a transition from typographic interpretive culture to a digital media interpretive culture. The visual has not supplanted words, but it becomes more prominent as a contextual supplement to words. In such an era, there are minority uses of media, or in each era, there are minority uses of media. Handwritten manuscripts, for example, <clears throat> although they are characteristic of the hearing dominant period, are still found in the modern world in some religious trans traditions, for example, the handwritten scrolls that are used within uh, Jewish synagogue contexts. Furthermore, the oral plays a role in every stage, <clears throat> and so throughout we have orality. Another aspect of uh, media history of the Bible involves the visual. Visuality played an integral role in the oral Bible through the appearance, movements, and gestures of the performance in the oral performance. The visuality of the performance and their movements provides an iconic link to the context of the biblical text. However, the oral Bible was fully functional without visuality. In other words, a person who could not see the performance could participate orally. In this sense, the visual aspects of the performance provide additional information, that is meta text, to guide the hearers and performers in their participation in the performed text. Visuality played numerous roles also in the manuscript Bible. We can provide four examples. First, the shapes of letters, the arrangement of letters, words, and phrases and, uh, in writing are all, all play a communicative role along the oral written text. 
Second, the visual representation of the interface between speech and writing has been identified within the biblical Hebrew text from the Dead Sea Scrolls through the use of stichography. The scribes of Qumran used white space and the arrangement of text in columns as a means to convey features of an oral performance of the text. A third example involves the work of the Masoretes, the Jewish scribes in the Middle Ages who transmitted scripture. They represented both the received written consonantal text and the oral vocalized text together with its accentual and intonational features. The oral written interface is especially clear in the master's use of the Kitiv Kare variants <clears throat> in scripture. So this is cases where the oral tradition of reading scripture differed from the written tradition. The master's then placed a marginal variant, the Kare, the red version, alongside the word in the text. The, uh, the Kitiv, and then the, which is the written one, then was kept in the unvowed tradition in scripture. In this way, the Masoretes transmitted both the oral tradition and the written tradition in parallel. As a fourth example, <clears throat> the tradition of illuminated biblical codices incorporated performative acts, aspects of the oral Bible into the written Bible through illustrations of the text. Furthermore, the visual layout of illuminated Bibles contributed to the oral reading of the text through, for example, illuminated letters to begin new chapters or sections of the text. In early printed Bibles, the visuality of the text continued in many ways the scribal traditions of the manuscript Bibles. In the influential English translation of the Geneva Bible of 1560, for example, 26 woodcuts were placed alongside the text in the Pentateuch Kings and Ezekiel in order to elucidate difficult passages. A large display letter again began the first word of each chapter. In addition, a table of names was given at the end of the Bible to assist readers in pronouncing them orally. Additional features of the visuality of printed Bibles includes the typeface used and their colors, so-called red letter editions, for the words of Jesus, the column or format, which mimics the columns of handwritten manuscripts, the formatting in chapters and verses, the kind of paper, the type of cover, etc. In the digital media uh, interpretive cult culture, the Bible can be presented in electronic formats with oral written visual interfaces, for example, in video. In this regard, the visual mediates between the oral and the written and guides the interpretation of both modalities. Visuality then plays a role with respect to the oral and to the written as a permeating metatext alongside the oral written text of the Bible in every era. The precise role and relationship of visuality to oral and written is different in the multiple contexts in which the Bible is produced and used. But the complex interrelationship of visual to both oral and written forms one of the central semiotic concerns for the translation of the Bible. As we noted above, the features of oral language and written language are culturally instantiated and must be identified within the incipient source text. Because the visual is also part of the semiotic fabric of the incipient text, we will also draw, draw attention to visual features. Written texts are rhetorically and are, uh, artistically constructed. The rhetorical techniques provide insight into the structure, the structure, style, and message of these texts. These rhetorical techniques relate to the oral performance of virtually all significant discourse in ancient biblical communities and are realized in various forms of verbal style for the purpose of message transmission, for example, participatory discourse and direct speech. Feelings and attitudes, for example, a, a joy, anger, sorrow, shame, and sincerity are also conveyed rhetorically and through performance. Written texts which are rhetorically and artistically constructed are referred to as literature. Literature not only concerns the appraisal of artistic form and quality of content, but also a consideration of contextually determined text functions. In this regard, this literature consists of a collection of sacred texts orally composed for oral articulation that is orature and relating to performance. Features of both literature and orature influence the verbal style in terms of repetition, mimicry, graphic Im imagery, idophones, uh, and temporal and spatial se uh, sequentiality. Certain rhetorically and artistically constructions served as mnemonic marks. 
memory interface to the creation of a text. An author would first generate a text or some portion of it in the mind before recording it in writing. There are a variety of elocutionary devices that serve to cement the essential content into a written text in such a way that it can be more readily preserved and remembered as well as more easily proclaimed orally and understood orally. That is, it can be performed. By uh, features uh, are a, 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 par a paratactic rhythmic ad additive formulaic language and antithetical thought patterns. All the texts that have come down to us in the written canon or the Bible represent a body of texts that are intertextually interdependent and that derive from an ideolo uh, ideology driven oral or scribal tradition of one form or another. They include multimodal indications of non-verbal techniques, for example, gestures, uh, facial features, as well as body movements. In a uh, written uh, translation, the multimodality factor concerns the semiotic interaction of the text with various metatextual or paratextual tools to convey different types of background information to a reader, for example, footnotes, sectional headings, glossary entries, cross, um, cross references, illustrations, etc. All of these meta texts serve to enlighten readers and uh, combat biblical illiteracy with respect to crucial presupposed aspects of the original context that cannot be communicated in a written uh, translation. Father of semiotics was Charles Sanders Peirce. Among his many theoretical insights was his identification of the three possible relationships of the sign to its referent. First, the relationship may be that of an icon in which the sign represents its referent. The English word slosh is an example of a word whose phonological shape mimics its meaning. The word is thus an iconic sign. Second, the relationship of the sign to its referent may be that of an index in which the sign points to its referent. Pronouns in a language are always indexical signs. The pronouns I or you point to persons within the speech context, and their reference can only be determined with reference to the speaker. Third, the relationship of the sign to its referent may be that of a symbol, in which there is a conventional or arbitrary relationship between the sign and its referent. An example is, <clears throat> is, the, uh, is words for this referent. In English, the sign is dog. In Hebrew, kelev. In Sushitu, it's cha. So it's a completely arbitrary relationship. <clears throat> These three concepts can be expanded to describe the relationship between the incipient text and the subsequent text. Tokens of translation may involve an iconic translation in which one or more aspects of the source text is mimically represented. They may also involve an indexical translation in which the translation points to some aspect of the source text without representing it directly. Tokens of translation may also involve a symbolic translation in which an aspect of the source text is represented with a conventional or arbitrary pairing of form and meaning. As an example, let us consider the first <coughs> Word, uh, Hebrew word of the lament in Lamentations chapter 1, Eicha. This word is used as an exclamation of grief, and it stands at the beginning of many laments. An iconic oral translation uses a comparable word in the subsequent, that is the target culture, which functions as an exclamation of grief and laments. An indexical oral translation would use some feature of the subsequent <coughs> target language which points to or indicates a lament such as a particular rhythmic style or performance. A symbolic <coughs> oral translation would indicate the meaning and function of echa using the linguistic resources of the language. We're now going to um, uh, illustrate our semiotic complexity approach to oral Bible translation with the translation of Lamentations 1 into Susutu. Uh, one of the official languages of South Africa, Bantu language. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, go through a few of the uh, analysis of the oral features in the incipient text of Lamentations 1, and then Chocolo will talk about how he incorporate those into his uh, translation. 
The first step in an oral Bible translation is to thoroughly analyze the biblical incipient text to determine which oral written features are present. Lamentations 1 is a lament, a genre relating to oral performance within a particular sociological context. One prominent feature of lament in ancient Israel has been identified as the kina meter, in which the first line has a meter of three and the second line has a meter of two, or at least a, a longer first line and a shorter second line. A particular rhythmic meter was probably present in these laments in ancient Israel, although the question of meter within poetry generally is debatable for Biblical Hebrew. Another feature of Lamentations 1 is the fact that it is an acrostic composition in which each successive verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Although it has been argued that the use of acrostics in poems is a literary device related to the scribal school texts in which students practiced writing the alphabet, there is an oral aspect related to the learning of the alphabet through recitation. Similarly, the oral performance of a lament whose verses begin with successive letters of the alphabet means that the listener is invited to understand the lament as structured around the alphabet. Just as the alphabet comprises all of the letters for representing the language, so the lament comprises a comprehensive expression of grief. An alphabetic acrostic then provides a vivid example of a literary structure that is at the interface between oral and written. Aspects of participatory discourse are also found in Lamentations 1. The lament begins with a general description of the city in verses 1 through 9a. The lament begins with, uh, sorry, in verse 9b, Jerusalem speaks to God. In verse 10b, God speaks. In verse 11b, Jerusalem speaks again to God. In verses 12 through 13, Jerusalem speaks to those passing by. In verses 14 to 19, there are three speeches of Jerusalem interspeaced with third-person descriptions of the desolation. In verses 20 through 22, uh, Jerusalem speaks again. We will see below that this seemingly simple oral structure poses particular problems for the translation into Sesutu. Aspects of orature found in Lamentations 1 include the pervasive use of repetition, this is um, clearly known, so I won't go on to that. So the repetition here of great and become. Repetition may also occur outside of par par parallel poetic structure, as seen in the repetition of forms of the verb yashav, to sit. Uh, in the second case, with wordplay, to sit is to settle, to be settled among the nations. Uh, and then we also have repetition with uh, the infinitive absolute plus a finite verb of the same root to express intensity or emotion. So she bitterly weeps uh, in the night. Okay, and uh, the next feature then uh, involves going down, uh, onomatopoeia. And so we have uh, the noun uh, um, to sigh, anach, which sounds like a person sighing. So her priests sigh, the city sighs, her inhabitants, and again, the priests. So throughout this chapter, we have that nice uh, imagery of sighing. We also have graphic imagery throughout. So this is a, an example of the roads being personified as if they're mourning because they're empty and the gates are, are empty. So the city itself, the physical um, infrastructure of the city is mourning. Okay. Uh, temporal sequentiality is not an, is an oral feature that doesn't play much of a role in the lament, but we do have one example in verse 8 where there is a, se a nice sequential structure. And then finally, emotional immediacy. We have um, five exclamations that are spoken by Lady Zion here. Uh, in verse 9, see, Lord, my agony that the enemy boasts. 111, see, Lord, and notice that I have become despised. 112, look about and see. Uh, 118, hear all you peoples and see my agony, and then 120, 121, let them become like me. Um, the five excl exclamations are all similar in that they are all um, call upon either God or the passerby to see, to notice, or hear. Only the final example does not ask God to see or take notice, but rather to act by making the situation of the enemies like those of Zion. We have a few instances of multimodality in this chapter. In verse 8, uh, Zion sighs, and then she turns backwards. In 117, Zion spreads out her hands. Okay, and finally, um, we can just mention the extensive use of parallelism, which is considered an oral feature in many cultures. Parallelism is pervasive in biblical Hebrew poetry, 
and also in the laments. Um, and what's very interesting is that in the Bible, it's very common in rep written, the written representations of direct speech, both in the prophets and in narrative, that there is parallelism. So it does seem that parallelism really was an oral feature of language in ancient Israel. In this section, we provide a traditional lament in Sesotho and briefly identify its oral features. The lament is for, is for a man named Silva Pokojwe, who died in 1992. The heading of the poem is Bosoko Ba Maikuto Pain of Sorrow by R. N. Pume. Lamentation in the name of Silo, who died in 19, oh, oh, uh, was born in 1941 and died in 1992. It goes like this. In the family of Tlakwaning, a different sun has risen. I say it was a different one, but the same as others. The truth, it is, has risen from the, from the east. It is heading to set in the west. In the very early hours of the morning, the line broke. No. Not in the early hours of the morning. The hour is the fifth one. The bitter one was heard, and it touched the heart of the people in a very painful way. Men with women came out running. It became the order of who comes first. What could really have happened? Here at Tlakwaning, what has happened? It must be something very serious. Poor Masolo was, what is the problem? Truly Silo is still young. Silo fails to understand. The one who has passed on is of the same age. The male child is the partner of his father. He is indeed his father's partner. Men, women with children be witnesses. All of you indeed be witnesses. Silo Pogoja slept asleep. Silo Pokojoy rested a rest. Silo achieved, he worked for cows, cow for Marcelo's dory. Silo, a male child, a partner to his father. He is left in Kakwaning, he is an ayah. Marcelo, comfort yourself. The most conspicuous features of orality in this poem of lament are redundancy, parallelism and rhythmic elements. All of these features are important for memorization. Example of repetition includes the following, line one and two, a different day, line one and three, has risen, line five and six, early hours of the morning. Now in line, uh, line 19, 20, and 27, we've got a repetition there. The male child is his father's partner. Line 19 is repeated again. Line 20 is repeated. And the line 27, there comes it up, up again. Line 21, we have witnesses. In line 22, also we have them. In line 25 and 26, we have cows. Now, in many cases of repetition, there is a kind of a tail head linkage of repetition between end of one line and the beginning of the following line, as indicated in line 25 and line 26 above. This is a, a, a common uh, oral feature of lament, which serves to draw out a lament and emphasis the sadness of the situation. For example, repetition also occur in the use of a noun and an object from the same root. Line 23, slept, a sleep. Line 24, rested, a rest. 
This construction is not, is not a normal in Soto. Rather, it's a future of poetic language and especially of the laments. The repetition as identified above also overlap with the concept of parallelism and especially synonymous parallelism. These two features, redundancy and parallelism, serve to structure the poem and hold it intact. Rhythmic elements are okay in a poem, for, as for example, with the words highlighted in red in lines four, three and four, risen from the east, set in the west. These two lines also illustrate the use of opposite word pairs, rise, set, and east and west. Risen from the, from the east, it's heading to set in the west. Poems in Sesotho are called Kodiyamalla, or lamentation, centered on emotions and feelings. The oral features are not only memorization, but they also re uh, raise the emotions of the audience. The poet's performance is also emotional and indicated by the emphatic statement such as, I say, in line two, present the repetition. We have seen that laments in Sesotho culture are structured in a particular way so that the individuals are, who are lamenting are immediately involved in the lament. In addition, features such as parallelism, repetition, and especially tail head repetition bring structure to the lament. Now the oral translation. In this section, we present an oral translation of Lamentation 1 in Sesotho. The oral translation is intended for the use in the con of a con congregation as part of an on ongoing program of scripture engagement through scripture performance. The various speaking roles have been divided between various groups in the congregation with the minister usually playing the speaking role of the prophet and the congregation playing the role of personified Jerusalem. In the middle of the dialogues, there are moments of silence for introspection by the whole congregation. These moments of silence add to the seriousness of the lament and promote the mediation of the congregation on the issue raised in the lament. Here, this is an example. Now the, the priest uh, speaks on, on behalf of, of the prophet. Alas, Jerusalem, alas, Jerusalem, the city that used to be full of people. But today, how lonely you are. You used to be the great amongst the nations of the world. Yes, today, look, you have become a widow among the nations of the world. You were a princess among the nations. But today, look, you have become only a slave. Now the fathers, Jerusalem, you are weeping. You are weeping bitterly. Tears is flowing on your cheeks. And there is no one from your friends that is comforting you. For your friends have betrayed you have betrayed you and have become your enemies. The mothers, Judah, you have been taken to captivity due to persecution and hard labor. You live among the nations and you don't even have a place to rest. All your persecutors have overtaken you. Indeed, they have overtaken you during the times of your troubles. Moment of silence, the youth come up with their verses. Road that lead to you, Zion, how lonely are they? For there is no one coming to your holy feasts. I say, even all your gates do not have people. As for your priests are groaning, your virgins are troubled. Zion, you are in great troubles. The whole congregation, those who fight you, Zion, are now reigning over you. And as for your enemies, are living in prosperity. You know, it seems as if the Lord has brought you trouble due to the multitude of your transgressions. Your children have been taken to captivity, have been taken to captivity by their fathers, by their fighters. The fathers, all the victory has been wiped away wept away from you, daughter of Zion. 
And our elders are like deers, like deers that are able to access the pastures. Those who are running, those who are tired, due to the running away from the persecutors, the priest again, in the time of your distress and that of your homelessness, Jerusalem, you remembered your treasures, all of your treasures, those which were yours long, long ago. When your, when your nation fell into the hands of enemies, no one helped you. Your enemies looked at your eyes and make a mockery of you by killing you. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have definitely seen it. For that reason, you are impure. All those who respected you now are the ones who despise you. They despise you for they have seen your nakedness. Indeed, Jerusalem is bordered by her, her groans. You turned away and hid her face. The mothers, by going to your month, Jerusalem, it sticks. It sticks to your clothes. You did not think about your future. Certainly, all your fall was a surprise. No one comforted you. The whole congregation again. Oh Lord, just look at my distress. Here the enemy today is praising himself. The youth, the enemy has stretched out his hand. He stretched it out and took all of your treasures. The minister, you Jerusalem, saw the nation enter, enter, entering your sanctuary. Those ones you order to say they must not enter your congregation. The fathers, all your people are bordered by groaning. They groan and they search for the bread. They trade their treasures for food so they can survive. The congregation again, oh Lord, look, see how am I despised. You all who pass by the road, does, does this say nothing to you? Look everywhere and see whether is there any distress, like my present one, distress that I was punished with, that the Lord has brought upon me on the day when his anger was fuming. Lord sent fire from high above. It entered into my bones. It descended into my feet. He spread a net. You made me to return, to return and to retreat. You made me to be left alone. He bent my loneliness every time. All my sins, you Lord know them. With your hand, you bound them and they became a lion upon your neck. You bound them like a yoke. They are heaviness and it caused me to be weak, to be greatly weak. Lord, you gave me to my enemies. You gave me to me. Those I cannot withstand. The congregation again, all mighty men who surrounded me, all of them, Lord, you just rejected them. You surmount the army to me, to attack me, to attack me so that my young men get crushed. Lord, you trodden vision of Judah. You have trodden her like a wine in its breast. That's the reason why I'm weeping. My eyes, my eyes flow with tears for my comforter is far from me. The one who would revive my spirit, my children are desolate for my enemy defeated me. The priest again, Zion, you stretch your hands, but the comforter is not there. For Jacob, Lord has made an order that his enemies will surround him. Jerusalem, you have been a filthy thing. Jerusalem, you are unclean. Jerusalem, the congregation is responding. Lord is good, for I have turned against his law. You all nation, listen, look, and see my distress. My young women and my young men 
all of them have been exiled. I called to my lovers, but I have realized that they betrayed me. Priests and my leaders have died. They have died on the streets of the city. They died while searching for the bread. Verse 20. Oh Lord, look, I am in trouble. I am in trouble. My spirit is in distress. My heart is troubled. For I have really turned against you. In the streets, the sword kills. In the house, what smells is only death. People have heard my groaning, but there's no one comfort me. All my enemies have heard about my trouble. They are delighted but such incident. Bring the day in the, in the first way, the one you announced, that my enemies will be like me. The evil doing of those evil enemies be brought to you and also their punishment be found. Punish them the way you have punished me. You punish me because of all my sins. My groan is too much and my heart is so disillusioned. As indicated above, the biblical lament begins with Eicha, an expression of, of grief. Sasutu lament uses the iconic translation by employing the same kind of exclamative expression, Joe, which signals the beginning of the lament. We can contrast the uh, ancient Septuagint translation, which recognizes the poem as a lament, but uses instead a symbolic translation to describe the fact that the following is a lament spoken by the prophet to Jerusalem. The beginning of verse one is chapter again reads, and it happened after Israel was taken captive and Jerusalem was laid waste. Jeremiah said weeping and gave this lament over Jerusalem and said, how the city can sit alone? She who was full of people, she has become a widow, multiple among the nation, a ruler amongst the countries. She has become a tribute. Note that although the scripture again renders the word a ha, they do so with the word pos, which does not directly signal the beginning of the lament in Greek. For this reason, a sentence was added to the Septuagint translators at the beginning of the lament to provide a, a metatextual framing of, of, of a lament. One important shift that has been made in Susutu oral translation, the description of dissolution of Jerusalem in verses 1 to 9a, 10a, and 11a from third person, as we found in Hebrew, to the second person. The use of second person to address the individual who is mourning is an important feature in Sutu Laments. This is illustrated in a traditional Sutu Lament in the previous section in which Masel Law, the widow of the deceased, is addressed. The Hebrew Lament creates a dating problem for Sutu hearers in that the, the person lamenting speaks but not, of, not spoken to. By reshaping the opening voices of the biblical lament from the third person to second person, the Sasutu translation sounds like a proper lament, and the immediacy of the lament is created for the hearers. The recasting of the initial verses from the third person to the second person also means that it is necessary to add the vocative Jerusalem in verse 1 and 2, so that it, clearly, it is clear who is being addressed to the grieving party. This recasting to the second person involves an indestical translation of the various features in the Hebrew that signal a lament. The second person shaping into the sort of point, points to the effect that it is a lament. In the same way, the kinach meta in Hebrew points to a lament. The oral sort of translation is able to represent an in a conic way that repetition of the Hebrew incipient text is presented. However, it is important to recall that the repetition is soto is used more pervasively and in particular with a tail head pattern of repetition of in laments. For this reason, the oral translation has incorporated additional instances of repetition and a special tail head repetition 
into the oral translation at multiple points. An example occurs in verses 19 with the phrase, they have died, which is repeated two, uh, two, two times. Yes, that uh, example, have died, they have died, they have died. Just as Hebrew laments use pervasive parallelism, so does Sesotho. The use of antithetical parallelism is highlighted in Sesotho, in some instances as illustrated in verse 8. All those who respected you now are the ones who despise you. Finally, we wish to mention the difficult problem for oral translation posed by the use of the Hebrew euphemism uncleanness in verse 9 as a metonymy for menstruation which causes ritual uncleanness. In the translation, the suit euphemism, go to your month, was used as an iconic translation. The mothers say, by going to your month in Jerusalem, it sticks, it sticks to your clothes. You did not think about your future. However, in oral performance, especially in the church setting, it is problematic for the minister, who is quite commonly a man, to speak of menstruation even by the way of euphemism. For this reason, the, the persona of, prophet, of, the, of the prophet in verse 9 is performed by the mothers of the congregation rather than by the minister. This example illustrates further the complex semiotic relationship that must be considered in oral Bible translation. A complete oral translation of the Book of Lamentation for the use of performative uh, scripture engagement will be produced in the coming months. The Book of Lamentation is especially important for Soto community in this junction time. The recreation of laments, of lamentation allowed participants to mourn the loss of everything held sacred and there in a time of social upheavals and change. It is important that the poet of lamentations that not, does not urge survivors to find consolation in Israel's glorious past, nor does the poet look forward to a happy tomorrow where the glorious past will be revived. Instead, lamentation shows us that ordinary persons who have known the depth of suffering can remember the unfailing love of the Lord in the midst of loss. The performance of lamentation as a means to grieve loss and recover hope is part of a broader program of performative scripture engagement in Sesotho that began with texts concerning happiness and continued with texts concerning forgiveness. In conclusion, we've considered in this paper how oral Bible translation takes place within a complex semiotic web of interrelationships. Oral Bible translation must begin with an intimate understanding of the oral written interface of the incipient text of ancient Israel and the early church. It then requires attention to the oral written interface of the hearing dominant or text dominant subsequent culture, and especially to the ways in which oral features are instantiated in various kinds of oral performance. Finally, the emergence of an oral Bible translation must take note of the various choices that are open to the translator in terms of the semiotic relationships that may be found between the incipient text and the subsequent text. Only by carefully examining each of the factors and being aware of the choices and their consequences for the emerging translation can there be a truly meaningful, memorable, and powerful oral translation of scripture. Thank you very much. All right, sorry about that. Thank you very much for, for bringing us this very interesting topic. As you know, a lot of times when you're in a situation like this, um, people tend to focus on narratives. 
but to bring in a lament, I think, is, is a very fresh perspective. So um, before I enter into questions, do any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask? And we, we do ask that you would use the microphone so it'll show up on the recording. In the last session, uh, uh, Sebastian Flo wanted to talk about authority, uh, where you're coming, where you're translating from. And I see that your presentation raises that prospect of how do you discuss uh, authority of source text in what you're in the uh, what you're calling the incipient of the beginning, but the other one was subsequent. How, how do you discuss that relationship? Uh, <clears throat> I hope I can answer you. Uh, the fact is that uh, there is a move uh, in text criticism. In fact, uh, it's a move uh, 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 what is called new philology, uh, uh, which is equal to editorial theory. So in classical textual criticism, you work towards a so-called first text uh, or uh, you have variants and you used a, uh, you try to reconstruct uh, a so-called forlage or a, uh, a, a, a possible uh, text uh, and in most cases you do not have such a text rather the move is now to understand that there are various variants in a text, uh, uh, texts. And uh, what you try to do is to determine within the social cultural context, why is uh, 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 this uh, variant there? So it's normally, you can then explain that it is a social cultural um, uh, aspect. So in a forthcoming article of us, uh, we deal with this in terms of Jesus uh, Siro, uh, or Ben Siro, uh, and uh, which has in certain cases no Hebrew text, it's lost. Then you have two uh, uh, Hebrew texts uh, similar and sometimes three. Uh, or, or uh, two different Hebrew texts that, uh, which are different. And um, you can then determine, for example, there is one case uh, where the one text read um, dog and the other text read lion. And um, so, uh, which is a correct one? Uh, the Greek used lion, uh, so uh, the dog uh, is uh, with, uh, when you look with in the social cultural context of ancient Israel, uh, the dog uh, is very negatively uh, seen. Uh, the lion can be interpreted uh, as very, in the Semitic world, very positively, uh, uh, normally with a king's house, uh, think in terms of the Babylonians, but uh, it can also be. Uh, very negatively. So the uh, fact is uh, someone tried to uh, 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 get away from dog and add a lion there, but uh, uh, it shows you uh, that uh, uh, it's a bad aspect, a bad side of a lion which is in that text. So for that reason uh, to look for what, uh, what, well, uh, if you uh, say, okay, it was lion, um, then you miss the whole thing if you do not have the other text where there is dog. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a, uh, in that article, uh, there are a lot of examples how it, it, it works. So come, uh, coming back to the authoritative text is that. Uh, uh, we work with Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, 
uh, we work with Nestle Alant 28. Uh, so that is, uh, th th these are the texts we are working with and by doing uh, any translation, you have the responsibility that uh, because you tell people, you translated that text. So uh, they, uh, 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 your translation must live up against uh, 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 what you are saying, what you define as translation, that uh, that must be reflected. Otherwise, you are not honest. And um, uh, in the complexity approach which we uh, are working on is that we uh, say uh, 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 various translation and oral translation or a written translation it's in fact not two different stuff, it's within this uh, whole thing from meta text to the oral aspects, uh, it must be coherent at the end. And uh, then uh, there is no problem then if you uh, do quality control on a translation that it reflects uh, uh, the uh, source text uh, or, or the incipient text, the Biblia Hebraica Stricta Artentia or Biblia Hebraica Quinta now, and uh, Nestle Alant, then I think one can be com comfortable. In translation studies, one must uh, remember there was a move away from the prescriptive to descriptive in the theory. So, uh, in no, uh, if you, uh, so we work with words like faithful, a uh, translation must be faithful too. Uh, and then faithful is meant equivalent. Uh, uh, so that's the reason why we work with, uh, or suggest in semiotics that um, there is a relation of a resemblance which can be indexical. A sim, uh, a symbolic or iconic and that's how uh, you, uh, you, uh, we can work you will never get a mirror image of a, uh, a so-called incipient text in a translation so uh, even if uh, the result is in oral it can be authoritative uh, if you are then uh, say uh, 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 that uh, is an adequate representation of uh, the, the incipient text. I hope I answer your question. Uh, thank you. I have a specific question for Reverend uh, Tsokolo. Uh, translating poetry is uh, fantastically complex, and uh, congratulations on your effort. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not seeing much of that, you know, a lot, a lot of poetic translation, of poetry translation is basically only in semantics, the meaning, often very stale, and what you have done there seems like a very rich exercise. I have two, two specific questions. Uh, one is, um, how did you, you know, I see, for example, that the, the parts, <coughs> excuse me, where the, the, the group answered that the poetic line is longer. You know, the syllable count is longer. You have up to 10 to 12 syllables, whereas the other poetic lines are around about seven or eight. You know, and this is a pattern I've seen elsewhere when we translated poetry from the Comoros, Mozambique, Angola. as a very typical band to feature that they, that they use the poetic lines that are that, that length. So it seems, you know, so my question to you is that that level of skill that, that you have displayed, is, is, has it been drafted orally or has it been drafted uh, in written form? That, that's, that's the first question. Um, yeah, and, and the other, other question is, have they been aware of the syllable count? You know, are they, are they aware of, you know, how many syllables they're using per poetic line? Is, is there a, an awareness of poetic features? Often they are not. Mm. Often translators are not aware of what they're doing. Uh, so those are the two questions I have. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the oral translation, 
that you see, that the proposed one, is based on the way how to do it in Susutu. But the oral features themselves, they also comes from the incipient text. That is now it comes from the source text, Hebrew. So before you have to, to, to translate or in any way or in any uh, mode of communication, for example, orality, you have to take in, con, into consideration the, uh, the uh, uh, um, oral features of the source text. So that is now to make the scripture authoritative. That's point number one. But now, how does this, how is it being appropriated in Sesotho? The Sesotho lament, how do they do it? That's now two basics and on, on the same level that produced this proposed translation. But we've got other two translations of the Bible, which I've consulted because of, of time. I didn't have time to, to present them here, but I've also gone through them, analyzing them with the Hebrew. So they look exactly the same as those uh, 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 oral features we are seeing here. But the first one, the 1909 one, that's the old ones, the literal translation. Uh, it's next to the Hebrew, but the oral features, unfortunately, they are not as many as the second one. That's not the 1989 one, where they use the dynamic equivalence translation. The poetic style, this poetic style you see here is presented exactly in the 1989 translation. So how does Soto, how do, how do we lament this Soto? What is, how does a Soto poetry look like? I think that is a point of departure. So it was, it was not translated, but I propose it based on those sources. The second question about the syllables and so forth, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't venture into, the, into that one. I just went to going through the, the, the translations, parallelism, and so forth. So counting of the syllables, um, I didn't venture into, into that one. But I think for the future, future references, we shall have to look at the, the, how does the syllables being counted, how, how to, how to uh, measure them in a typo, typological way, that is now comparatively speaking, with other Bantu languages, for example, uh, what uh, language spoken in Setswana, uh, North Soto, how are they, how are they measuring? But for now, it's a, it's, a, it's a question that is meant for, for the other day to be researched. <laughs> I think as Bible translators, we can go through that one to say, okay, how many syllables for us to translate a, a poem? But because it's not easy to translate a poem. It's very difficult. It's like translating Proverbs. It's very, very difficult. Translating Psalms is very, very difficult. Translating uh, uh, also Kohelet. Uh, Kohelet is also very difficult to translate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know whether if I ask a question. I think we have time for one more question. So here comes the mic. Thanks. Thank you so much, all three of you. Fantastic uh, presentation, very thorough. Um, and opportunity to ask many questions. I'll only ask one. Um, th this uh, decision to be disloyal to the incipient text by going from third person pronoun to second person pronoun in the subsequent text. Um, what would you think about um, sort of some sort of hierarchy of decision making about when you can be disloyal to this? And for example, you, you, you indicated it was the, um, uh, the host language that uh, required this change. What if it also was part of um, the translation brief where you said it was a performative translation that uh, the second person in a more general sense does that interactive performative nature and that that uh, value in a translation brief would put it at a higher uh, piece of loyalty for the translation than the loyalty to the third person. 
There was a question in there, but I was also making observations. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, like I have uh, answered the first question of uh, moving from the third person to the second person. Remember that this one is going is, is a performance, is a live performance, and it must not only be a performance for the sake of performing. It has to touch the lives of of the people. Now, moving from a level of of the third person, it becomes more abstract. Then, when coming to the level of the second person, it is now nearer to the people. Now, the people can now say, "Okay, this is." That is why those uh, statements where Jerusalem is, is answering is making a confession. That is now the now the congregation. They are, they are confessing to the Lord about their sins. So that is how it is, it is captured in, in, a, in a liturgical format to say, this is where we have sinned. We have sinned like Jerusalem. So now, if you have sinned like Jerusalem, you are going to face consequences like Jerusalem did. So that is my mode of moving from the third, uh, third person to the second person just to make it to be nearer to the people. Okay, I think our time is up for this session. So um, we are about to head to break, so I'm sure that you can catch them and ask your questions in private. But thank you again very much. Please join me. Thank you.